Thank you for joining me. I'm Jessica Lawrence, the host of North Country Bookmarks on North Country Public Radio. We're excited to present a live bookmark special. And tonight we're talking to Catherine Doucette, St. Lawrence University class of 2004, and Dr. Robert Kauser. Catherine's book, On the Run, Finding the Trail Home, is a collection of essays that I couldn't put down. And I'm really excited to speak with her. If you don't have a copy yourself, St. Lawrence University's Brewer Bookstore is selling it right now. So you can go in and pick it up or you can go online to brewerbookstore.com. So thank you so much to Kate and Bob for joining me. Catherine, I wanna ask you to begin, how did you choose the title of your book, On the Run, Finding the Trail Home? So it's typical not always um, true, but it's typical to choose an essay title for the title of your book. And although the primary subject matter or the primary sport is probably skiing, I really felt that this collection was about movement and about moving forward. Um, even when I didn't know what I was doing, I always felt like movement was a good choice. Um, and then finding the trail home also because of the searching aspect of it. You know, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm looking for something. <laughs> and I think I know, I will know when I find it. So that's how the title came to be. And there was some discussion with the publisher about what the title should be. I, maybe there always is, I don't know. Um, but I really felt that something that suggested movement and moving through life um, in the search for belonging was an apt choice. Yes. So Bob, question for you, kind of the flip side of the coin. Why are essays important in literature? That's a really good question. I think um, particularly, you know, nonfiction, usually, you know, in the bookstore, you're going to find um, memoirs, right? I don't know if Kate got this pressure. I, I remember conversations with you, Kate, pressure to turn a collection of essays into a continuous narrative, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you called me and I had had, when I when my collection of essays, which was my uh, PhD dissertation, was, was when I was uh, shopping that around, I had the same reaction. Like, could you turn this into a continuous narrative? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really about uh, a commitment to this form, which, which to me is, uh, feels more like the way life comes at you. Like you could have, Kate could have told the story as, one trip across the country or, you know, but instead it was really several trips. And so it, it's about representing, representing life more authentically. And the other way that, you know, what I'd say in the classroom a lot is that the novel uh, represents, you know, uh, it mimes the world. The essay mimes the mind in the act of apprehending the world. So it's about, it's writing about thinking as opposed to writing only about doing or, or moving, right? So I feel like Kate's book is about what was on her mind as she made these mini trips down mountains across countries on the ice, you know, it's like what's going on in her, and that's what the essay is. Not to, I don't want to be too long winded about it. But. <laughs> so Kate, you told my coworker, Emily Russell, who is leaps and bounds ahead of me when it comes to outdoor activities, I should point that out. You told her yesterday that this book was really a culmination of you journaling your trips. When and why did you start journaling? And also, do you think that that helped you become the author that you are today? Probably. I'm a big believer in the practice of writing, that just like anything else, the more you practice, the better you're going to get. Um, and for me, journaling was one of the ways that I practiced, but it was also a way for me to keep track of all of these trips. I was super lucky to travel and to ski and hike and run a lot. And I wouldn't wanna say that those weren't all important individual experiences, but they can blur. <laughs> so um, the details were really important. And also I would write down just the basic notes of what happened that day sometimes, and it would trigger the bigger memory of the trip. And I started journaling back in high school, I did, um, a senior project out to California and then to Wyoming to study natural horsemanship and the academic component of that for my high school the White Mountain School was that I think I wrote two papers and a bunch of poems so I started to write every single night so that I would have the fodder 
when I got back to New Hampshire to glean those details and put them into poems and papers. So it really started a long time ago. And then I carried that forward. Do you still continue to journal? I do, not as much as I should, but I also haven't recently been on as many big trips. And I always pack a journal when I go on one of those trips and make, you know, in my bunk at night with my headlamp on, you know, make a few notes at least before I go to sleep. Um, so I'm sure when I return to those trips, I'll, I'll start again. Nice. It would be really great, Kate, if you would be able to read a passage for us. Sure. Um, so I'm going to read from the very first essay in the book, When the Lake Makes Ice. I can no longer remember the first time I heard the ice booming on a frigid night. That exact moment eludes me, not so much slipped from my mind as fused into the layers of childhood memory bound to the accumulations of the past. I grew up on the steely edges of Forest Lake in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. There was something silent and selfish about winters for me. Our home and my grandmother's home, just two doors down, were the only winter residences on our side of the lake. Although the bulging dirt road was plowed for us in the winter time, the rumble of the plow rarely broke our winter slumber. We were not the town's main concern. The summer folk had stowed their canoes upside down, drained their water pipes, locked and shuttered their windows, and pulled their docks up on the sandy shoreline. In the winter months of my childhood, the lake belonged to me again. Only the occasional cross-country skier, ice fisherman, or snowmobiler trespassed on my white oval. Otherwise, and especially at night, the lake was mine. During snapping cold nights, my dad zipped up his old gray coat, laced his battered hockey skates, and ducked out the front door. Alongside our dock was the outline of a rectangle of ice, snowbanks heaping around the edges. Grabbing the rusted scoop shovel, he would methodically scrape the rink free of snow. Although I couldn't always see the push and glide of my father's figure, a six foot frame hunched against the shovel and the night, I could hear the scrape of the metal blade against the cold surface. The rink looked like a carefully tended field, rows of shovel marks disappearing into the nighttime. Once it was cleared, he dipped five gallon buckets through a hand chopped hole. Skating out with the buckets dripping, he threw the dark water onto the ice. Cool lake water flooded the cracks and seeped into the gaps. The spotlight attached to the house cast dad in thin shadows as he worked to create this space for us. Only on the coldest nights would he be out flooding, which would even out the ice, eliminate the friction and restore the rink. We awoke to smooth surfaces refreshed by work and water. But this is how a skating rink is maintained, not how the lake builds that thick plate of ice each year. The lake forms skims of ice that first cling to the dock and shore close to home and eventually reach out to cover the whole expanse of water. Frosty fingers stretch away from the shore to creep into the deeper waters, growing and spreading until they join with ice from the opposite shore. Far in the distance to form the first delicate skin. That is how it begins. New ice accumulates one layer at a time, but it is created from below. Water is the only known non-metallic substance that expands when it freezes, and younger layers of fresh ice push the existing ice upward, splitting it like an old skin that no longer fits but refuses to be shed. The oldest ice is on top, history turned upside down to expose the cracks of the past. Fractures shoot and explode across the plate, reverberating like snapping cables. It is an an oddly electronic and far reaching report in the night air. I'll stop so there. I read that and I was getting total Richard Ford uh, vibes because of Canada, uh, which was a great book, but it really also resonated with me being a figure skater my whole life and um, living on the St. Lawrence River in the summertime. So I, I totally understood that. Why did you pick that passage in particular? Um, 
well, it, it feels to me like my beginnings were at Forest Lake. That's where I grew up and it informed so much of my life and my experience. But also I think that this idea of growing and gaining strength through fracture is just a beautiful image and a beautiful idea that carries well through the rest of the collection. Absolutely. So let's get right to it, Bob. I'm dying to know, <laughs> when did you first meet Catherine Doucette? Um, I didn't know the year I had to ask Kate, but I, I'm almost, was it, it was that maybe late in your career, maybe your junior year, but it was in my introduction to creative nonfiction writing class, which I've taught almost every semester for 23 years now. And I remember she sat in the very first seat in the very in the corner row in room 304 in Richardson Hall. And um, I remember that everything Kate wrote was short, <laughs> packed, just like a lot of the essays in this book. And um, I felt like this was something you hadn't done before. And um, like a lot of other things, if you put something in front of Kate that she's never done before, all you're gonna do is challenge her to perfect it. That's just her nature. She's just so contrary. So she said, you know, she sort of took the bit in her teeth and said, I'm going to figure out how to do this. And when that class was over, then you took advanced nonfiction with someone else. And then you came to me and said, would you like to do an honors project together? Right. And I said, yes. Yeah. And um, a lot of this stuff, th there aren't the same essays, but your father certainly was important in that. Mm -hmm. I read the passage you just read is my favorite in the book. And I think probably because he was my favorite character in that project that you wrote. And his work was what I remember. Like, that's what you admired was work. Mm -hmm. That's what he instilled in you in effort. And so I, I just remember you saying, has anyone ever written an honors project that was like a really, a lot of really short pieces? And I said, no. And you said, then that's what I think I'm going to do. Right. Yeah. You know, Glimpse like, essays, postcard yeah, essays. Right, right yeah. exactly. And so, and you know, then we've just, over the years, we've, every Associated Writing Programs conference that we were together at, we would meet and have coffee. And Kate would say, I'm still working on it. I'm still grinding away at it. And I would say, keep it up, you know, and had some, a few phone calls right over the years where you said, do you think I should still do this? And I would say, yes, you should still. So yeah, that, that's what, what I remember is um, just, uh, you know, um, the, the look on Kate's face was always a deeper focus beyond just the class. Like there was some, some desire to really, I mean, I've had, I think I was saying before we started, maybe probably somewhere between 1200 and 1500 students and, five that have published books maybe you know and it, it takes that it's that kind of um commitment really sure. do you see a big difference between her early work you know in like 2002 2003 to this essay um not in terms of what it's concerned about like what it what it's worrying about and thinking about um no but but of course her you know her the craft is you know, she's gone to, to graduate school and had wonderful teachers and has perfected it, you know, and continued to work. But the things that Kate has ruminated about have remained the same. Home, snow, ice, cold, work, you know, um, movement, as she says. I think those, those are, I think that's true of a lot of, that's what I love about the essay is, you know, Philip Lopate wrote three or four different essays about his, his parents and every 10 years he had to update it because his thoughts about it changed. And that's the way, you know, again, you ruminate, you chew on this, the same kinds of core issues. And I see that consistently through, through Kate's work. Nice. So Kate, growing up in New Hampshire, you were exposed at a very early age, like we just learned, to mountains, hiking, and all four seasons, of course. When choosing St. Lawrence for college, did the landscape of Canton and the greater Adirondack Park play a role in your decision to attend St. Lawrence? It was one of the factors, absolutely. Um, before I really even considered St. Lawrence, I had a phone call with Phil Royce, who is the um, director of the outdoor program. So I knew that there was an active outdoor community and obviously the proximity to the Adirondacks um, was appealing. So I knew that I could come and be a guide and get connected with other people who love to be outside. And so that was a huge plus. So I think before even I applied, I knew that there was, um, or there were opportunities to be in the outdoors a lot in Canton. And that was 
important to me, even back when I was in high school. We have an audience question, which I'm sorry for not saying this sooner, but you can certainly send a question in the Q&A and I'm happy to pass it along if we have time. Sue Novak, who's a professor at SUNY Potsdam, asks any advice from either or both of you about finding interesting things to write about for someone who's lived a long life best described as boring and white bread in every sense of the word. Kate, I'll let you field that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, on some level, it feels like it doesn't matter what the subject matter is because you're always writing about your life and you're writing about the connective tissue of being a human, which can be really messy, but that is um, what resonates with other people. So, I, you know, I read Bob's book on football and I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm not a huge football fan and I don't know much about it, but Do it was about life. Do you know how many times I've heard that? Right. Like it was about life. So it didn't matter that I didn't really know anything about football. And I hope that my collection also can cross those barriers that you can not be a skier or really interested in hiking, but that it's really about the human experience more than it is about the actual activity. So um, I don't I don't know if that's a valid answer. I'm not sure it's as important the activities that you write about as it is that you share your experiences sure. of being part of the world. Right. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, that's what I would say. I mean, you know, I'm the great indoorsman. I don't hike or ski or any of that stuff. Um, but, you know, again, what you're representing is what's going on, you know, the, the re act of the mind apprehending the world. So I, I, I had to field that question in class a lot. Um, one, of my, one, one story I tell is I got an assignment once or gave an assignment once you know, write about the turning point, a turning point in your life. I was just beginning to teach this form. And a, the best essay that I got was from a woman who wrote, I haven't had one yet. The contrariness of her answer was, it gave her all the conflict and tension she needed and it was great. So, yeah. I mean, I'm on team Bob for this one because I, I also <laughs> love the indoors. I love Wi-Fi and air conditioning. So I'm totally on board with you. But I, I actually What's emailed to New York. That's the question. <laughs> right, exactly. I actually emailed Kate and let her know that the last essay in this book really did resonate with me. And I cried of which, I mean, at this point, anybody who works with me knows I cry all the time anyway. So, but really it was a really moving and powerful essay. And I know Emily Russell, my coworker also read it. And she really liked the fact that it was sort of an open-ended or made you want to learn more, which it totally does. But you know, I think it really showed your vulnerability, Kate, and, and you were very honest. And, and in many ways, I related to so much of what you said, not even living and experiencing the life that you have lived. But for me, as now, as you know, a single mom and at a crossroads in my life, when I moved back to Canton, that was something that sort of hit me. And so I really appreciated your words. Yeah, she, she, I, I noticed that too, angst and hope there at the end in a, in a kind of tension. So it's where we might think we were going to get some resolution. Instead, we get more conflict. Right. Yeah. Sorry, Someone please. in some class once told me I didn't have to answer all the questions. <laughs> Who was that genius? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Bob, Kate thanks you at the introduction of the book for your years of lifelong support. Can you share with us what you did to assist Kate in the publication of this book? everything <laughs> all of the things no, i'm kidding she's very she's very generous in her in her gratitude and it's probably overstated but you know i mean you know i think we we just stayed in touch and we you know support each support each other talking about our writing and our work and when, when we were at a conference together in portland i remember once or was it seattle or maybe both and then in la you know we yeah. would just get together have coffee check in and I think, again, this is a, the essay is a quiet, um, misunderstood, uh, overlooked form. And if you're going to work in that primarily, it, re it requires, you know, commitment to each other and to, the, and to, you know, so she would say, I'm getting pressure to do this or that. And I would say, no, stay the course, ask big questions you're not obligated to answer, live with the tension, all the stuff. And she would, you know, same thing. I read your book. I hate football, but it's nice. All that stuff. So we just... <laughs> We just, uh, you know, just 
kept touching base over time, I think. And um, I, I'm trying to remember, did you send, you certainly, I, I found your essays that as they came out in magazines and read them. And mm -hmm. I think you sent drafts to me and, you know, um, and I don't, again, I don't do that with all, all of my students, but, but a, a good handful I do. And that's the, one of the, my favorite parts of my job is watching, you know, watching Kate develop was, was mixed, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't take much credit for it, but you still have a kind of pride in that. So just, you know, just that. Sure. Bob, I think I already know the answer to this because you, you might've mentioned it, but do you have a favorite essay in this collection? Yes. It's the, the, the making ice essay that she just read. And, um, because I think because it, uh, I, it has the most, maybe the most intricate system of images of all the essays, like the, the way the, the analogy or the metaphor that she creates around that. Um, and in the presence of her dad, who, who is a sentimental favorite of mine. I don't know many of the characters later. I don't actually know her father. I did meet your mom once. We and, had dinner. Yes, yeah. we, I, was at, I was at a writer's colony in Vermont and we met, right? Yep, it sounds right, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think you two were passing through, I don't know, it was, anyway. But, but uh, just a kind of sentimental connection to that one, I think probably, but I think it's a, it's a solid book throughout. What, what connects it is a kind of, a kind of like um, uh, an, uh, commitment anxiety writ large, right up to the very last <laughs> sentence, which is interesting for a woman who's a, you know, in a relationship and as a mother, but I also connected to that as a parent, you know, that, that you know, we make these commitments, but we, as an essayist, we allow ourselves to, to rethink them all the time, all the time, you know, as opposed to sentimentally saying, oh, it's the greatest thing ever. No, like I still want to move. I still daydream about ski trips. I still, you know, those parts of us live on. So I like that about the whole book. Amanda Smith is wondering, Kate, if you have a favorite essay in this collection. Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm at the point with where this book is. I am so sick of my own writing. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I mean, I have been working on this a really long time, but the the run up to publication is that you read it over and over and over again, which I was happy to do to get to this point. But now I am thrilled to be looking forward to the next words that I'm writing. Right. Um, Although I do think that the, the very first essay does feel like a, a beginning to me and it feels like it sets the collection up um, to really carry the, the themes for the rest of the essays. So, and I mean, yeah, I, my family is incredible and I'm really lucky that, <laughs> that I have parents that let me write about both of them, you know, and support and respect that. Sure. So it's a nice way to start. Um, I know Kristen Hanna, who wrote The Four Winds, I mean, she wrote The Nightingale, you know, obviously comparing nonfiction to fiction. But when I interviewed her for the show, she also said to me, when she's done a book, she's like exhausted, ready to do nothing for two months and just completely decompress. So as a follow up, Amanda would like to know, what was the hardest to write? Um, I think maybe not the hardest to write, but the hardest to include in the collection was that little one called Close um, that's set in Bar Harbor, Maine, um, that is sort of traumatic and stabby. Scary, <laughs> and, I, would, I would describe it as scary. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was a big leap for me. I felt like it was really important to the collection because it lets you know a little slice of life of why I have these commitment questions, <laughs> to put it lightly, and why I think that I'm not great at reading men. Um, but it was a very hard decision to be like, yeah, that's, I'm going to put that in my, my book and like people's parents are going to read it. You know, <laughs> like that was a big step for me. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, question from Kristen Eaton. She's wondering, what adventures do you look forward to taking next? I know you have a child and you have another child that's going to be here soon. Yes. Um, I just signed on for another British Columbia backcountry ski trip 
in 2023, <laughs> which is about when you need to book them at this point. And it's with my um, Oregon guys crew, basically. And it will be another one of these trips where you get the heli bump in and then you earn the turns for the next several days. And I am really looking forward to that. It feels like a long ways away, but that's sort of the next big thing I have on the radar. Sure. So a question actually for both of you from Aaron Todd. He's wondering if you can describe the process you take from the beginning of an idea to the final draft. Do you generally have an idea of how they will turn out or does the focus change and evolve as you write? Bob, you wanna hop in there? Sure, uh, I mean, you know, I, I'll, I think we should both take a stab at it. Um, Aaron Todd, who also was a honors project student of mine at St. Lawrence in the old days. Um, yeah, I was just, I'm just about to start writing something now. And, and it's, you know, um, I think what I hope that I'm doing in class is teaching students to develop antenna for the for that kind of anxieties that you have in your daily life and then learn to process them through the form of the essay and then you know i sat down today and i was talking with my partner about what i'm going to write and i said to her at one point i don't really know how it's going to turn out that's the great thing about the essay i know what question i'm asking but i don't know um what my what even the answer will be that i propose to myself so uh but it's really i think the hardest part and i think this gets back in, in some ways to that first audience question which is you know, what do you write about? But we all, I used to say to students, you probably remember this, Kate, like, what were you thinking about between your dorm and this classroom building? That what was that? You have to somehow figure out how to tap into that. And once you do that, once you develop that antenna, then you're always going to have things that you can start writing about. And some of them you'll abandon and some of them will be really fruitful. And that's my answer. I don't know what you would say, Kate. I mean, similarly, sometimes you have those moments that stick with you and you don't even know why they stick with you and you're like why do I keep thinking about that so you jot down something that someone said to you or like a weird circumstance or um, some, something that made you emotional and you don't really know why and then you sort of work with that on the page and you like Bob was saying you don't always know what's going to come out but it's always interesting and for me it's a learning process sometimes you know I have an intention of putting something on the page and something else comes out. And I'm like, all right, I guess that's what that's about. And it doesn't mean it's going anywhere, but sometimes it does. And when it does begin to take a form or connect to another memory or event, that's sort of when it gets cool. Yeah. You're like, oh, this is, this can be about something. Right. Well, the, yeah. the, essay, the word essay in French means uh, to attempt. So yeah. Sometimes, again, like I said, sometimes you abandon it, but it's, yeah, it's, and the daily practice as you were talking about is so important too. Like not just letting that run out of your mind, but actually making an effort to record some form of it. Right. I also had a professor tell me at OSU, he was like, you know, it's not always the best write writers who make it. They're the writers who just keep writing, like just keep at it. That's how you get published. That's how you um, you know, get to a point where you're having traction. You keep sending stuff out, you keep writing new stuff, you answer prompts, you answer calls, and a lot of it is rejection. But as long as you keep going, a lot of other people aren't going to keep going. Right. So. so a question that I thought of, which is also going to piggyback off of an audience question. Obviously, all of these essays are personal to you, Kate. So I'm sure it's it is hard to have a favorite, I'm sure. And I'm wondering, were there other essays that had to be cut from this book in particular? And do you hope to use them in another perhaps book or another time in other publications? Um, there are definitely essays that have been published or not published in the past that I could have tried to sort of fit in this collection. But I really felt like um, some of those essays, even though they were successful in other arenas, weren't meant to be a part of this journey. So there were a couple that I tried to wrestle with a little bit um, to include, but it's a short collection and it's because I was really intentional in the choices I made. So those essays that I left out, who knows, there's a chance they might resurface again there's always a chance, especially if it was unpublished or I'm still 
trying to massage it into something better. Um, but I don't know. I'm thinking that my next project might be a memoir. So maybe some of those essays will inform my work going forward. I mean, they all do um, in one way or another, whether they were successful or not. But I'm thinking of a new writing project moving forward. Nice. Will you walk me through the process of, obviously you selected the essays, but did you create, did, are they in a particular order that you specifically wanted or was that something your publisher sort of requested? How did that come to play? I did order them um, to sort of have an arc to the collection and they're not chronological, which is sort of interesting, but I felt like this was the best way that they built on one another in terms of varying my experiences. You know, you don't want every ski essay in a row. Nobody wants that. <laughs> so I did intentionally order them. Um, and in the review process, there were some questions about the order, but that was ultimately um, left up to my discretion, which was nice. Bob, would you agree with the order in which Kate has the book. Do I like the order? Is that what you mean? Do yeah, I? Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, and you know, a, a, I, they're ordered in, you know, you order essays in the same, I think in much the same way you would order a collection of poems, that there is a kind of rhythm to it. Um, and there, you know, there are concerns that pick up on one another. I think, as you said, I mean, your first essay has to set up that system of images, system of relationships, the ground, it grounds you my collection did the same thing it had and that metaphor kind of extended it through the whole book like the ice does and um i think so yeah absolutely i think it's very well put together we might say bob as a professor at st lawrence do you feel like you're really able to cultivate relationships with students that continue over time after they graduate like in the instance of kate well they're not all as rich and wonderful as my friends <laughs> But I mean, I'm looking at the list of participants, and people that, and there are so many names I recognize. And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes a small liberal arts college really unique and wonderful is that because classes are small, um, I can often do that. And because I teach writing, it's, I think it's different, you know, I mean, especially I teach personal writing, nonfiction mm -hmm. writing. So very often I learn a lot about people and they feel connected to me. I certainly feel connected to them. So yeah, I mean, Kate is special, but uh, my friendship with Kate is special, but um, there are many, um, you know, I'm really proud of, of the, the friendships that I've been able to, to make with the students here. Best I remember, I remember coming to class one day, Bob, and you know, classes are at the same time every week and it <clears throat> followed my riding lesson. So I always came in my boots and britches, always, because I was coming right from the barn to class. And one day, for whatever reason, things changed and I wasn't in my boots and britches. And, and Bob pulled me aside. He's like, are you okay? <laughs> like, yeah, it's fine. Like my schedule just changed. But it's also, you know, those sorts of relationships. You see your professor every day and it's not a TA and it's not a class of a hundred. You know, there are eight people in there. So, and you're sharing personal stories. So you really get to know, I think, um, with creative nonfiction in particular, you get to know the people pretty well, which is nice. Kate, yeah. your, your writing coach wants me to mention um, that that's a good look. What you went to <laughs> class in was a good look. Every day. I wanted, you, I wanted you to tell the story. I mean, I meant to tell the story. I think it's, it's uh, uh, you know, the story of how you, of your writing career is really uh, indicative of your character too. Didn't you come to St. Lawrence with no experience Competing. I mean, I had been a horseback rider, but I, yeah, I wasn't competitive. Right. And then I was very competitive. <laughs> well, that's your nature. <laughs> yeah, I've Has been I told that. that. No, then I'm going to do it. That's pretty much Kate you said. <laughs> Kate, another question from the audience. Which adventure are you most proud of from your past? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. Um, that's, that's a good question. <clears throat> I did, uh, three weeks in the Alaskan backcountry with my brothers and my friends, Silas and Sabin, and that stands out. I mean, because we had three weeks to go skiing. 
Um, but I also, that really pushed my limits and I learned a lot on that trip and it was very technical. Um, so I'm grateful for that experience and that stands out, but I've also done a couple races that I don't write about, um, like backcountry races in Crested Butte and in Aspen, um, that I had to train for. <laughs> and I'm proud of those, even though this book wasn't about those races. I, as Bob mentioned, apparently I am competitive apparently. and I like these, um, especially these big like ski mountaineering races and you know you you go with a partner so it's also about that companion that you trust it's all this it's all the same themes right and you train to accomplish a big goal sometimes in the snow so those are things that stand out in my mind can I ask a follow-up Jess sure um so so as a parent how do you feel about like how what will what has been what will be your approach in terms of things like competition an adventure is this something you want to do with your children is it how will you handle you know I mean I, I think when you have an accomplished parent it can be a challenge I see this a lot at St. Lawrence students who come here have accomplished parents as athletes and, and or in, in their professional lives how do you how do you think about that with the children I mean my daughter is two so I haven't thought I'm not about married yet really Come on. Um, but I think actually it's advice my parents gave to another friend of mine um, about parenting, which was to figure out what your child loved and then support them in that. So I'm hoping that I can do that with, with grace. Has my two-year-old already been on a horse? Maybe, but. <laughs> what about down a mountain? Uh, in a sled. I was wondering the same thing because I, you know, reading the essay when your mom, your, you remember being with your brothers and your parents when they're, you know, you're holding your dad's hand and climbing. I actually had that question for you myself was to find out if you've taken your daughter hiking yet, because that was such a great, you know, vivid picture that it came for me. Yeah. A former St. Lawrence student um, on her Instagram story recently just had her, her daughter, she was on the ski team, but she had her daughter skiing and she was old down a mountain all by herself so yeah no and pressure been on skis yet right <laughs> uh another audience question i'm curious to know who kate turns to for writing inspiration your favorite essays of all time or writers wow um that's a good question i loved uh a little bit more about me by pam houston I think probably partly because of the subject matter. Um, but I also came away from grad school from Oregon State University with a fabulous um, writing friend. And I have read almost everything she's written since we graduated. And she has read my work as well. Um, her name is Dionysia Morales, and she published a book a few years ago called Homing Instincts. It's a collection of essays. And in terms of people who inspire me, she is right up there because she's the person who keeps going with me. And it doesn't matter if you have one paragraph or one sentence or, or you think you have a super shitty draft. Um, I know that I can send it to her and she will be honest and we can sort of work through this hustle and through life as, as parents and as busy um, humans together and keep, um, keep pushing each other to continue. So she is one of my main inspirations. I know that's like pretty specific, but I'm, I'm grateful to have that um, in my life, that sort of writing friend. Sure. How, I mean, on a typical day when you have the time, a good question for both of you actually, how much do you spend writing a day when you have the time? Bob, it looks like you want to answer that question. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, Kate, why don't you take it and I'll, and I'll respond. Not oh. enough, not enough. Yeah, that um, is the right answer. I mean, when I look in the mirror, what I say to myself is, and you call yourself a writer, you know, and, and, you know, I always say if my house is really clean, which it is right now, it means I have something I'm supposed to write that I'm not writing. So I've got three things this summer and I haven't started them. So 
not well, and I but also the, count things like editing as writerly things. Mm -hmm. That's so that's mostly what I've been doing was to get this book in shape for publication. Um, I also do a little freelance work here and there, and I count that as doing writerly things. Um, but I am excited now that this collection is in print and sort of out in the world to start thinking about a better routine where I sit in front of a computer every day for a certain amount of time, whether I write three words or 10 or 20. My, my favorite story about John McPhee, and if you go to any bookstore, you'll see he has a stack of books taller than I am, is that he would sit, he would tie himself to his chair with the belt of his bathrobe every day until he'd written 500 words. It's not that, 500 is not that much, but if you do it every day, you produce a lot of words. And, uh, you know, and I keep, I'm 51 now, I keep saying, oh, next year will be the year, but we'll see. It's funny, Lois Lowry, when I interviewed her, uh, she's, she's 83 and she said she makes it a point to write every single day and sort of piggybacking off what you said, Kate, sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's editing, sometimes it's reading even, just like reading back what you wrote before. And that's really helpful for her and she's 83. So talk about goals. Even reading around, yeah. I think if, if, I'm, if I'm not, if I don't have a book open, Kind of in my life then it's probably a good bet that i'm also not writing or thinking about writing so that it all kind of nurtures itself okay an interesting question that just came from the audience she says you say you had challenges with relationships with men and finding the right guy why do you think that was having two brothers and spending a lot of time hanging out with guys who are doing who love doing what you also loved I mean, that's a good question. I'm not sure, sure I know the answer to it now. <laughs> um, I think that part of that is that I was interested primarily in the beginning in just being outdoors and less in like trying to hustle a relationship out of those experiences. Um, and I don't think that I'm, I might have a, two brothers who are wonderful but that doesn't necessarily make you terribly perceptive to the advances of you know <laughs> men <laughs> in general so I also I have this great crew um, of skiers that I met in Oregon and now they're sort of spread all over um, but one of the rules of the trip um, when this one guy my friend Chris organized it was that no couples could come on the trips because he thought that relationship dynamics would mess with the group dynamics, right? If you want to go home and hang out with your partner instead of ski a line, like what good is that? <laughs> so it sort of, it was sort of funny. It kept us focused on the skiing and being together as a group that was not romantically involved. And I thought that was interesting, random rule, but having gone on several trips with this guy, I'm like, ah, it might be something to it. I don't know. <laughs> We learn a lot about your family throughout the book, especially your brothers, like we were just chatting about, skiing with them in particular. What has been the reaction from your family in regards to On the Run? Um, I mean, they've been nothing but um, supportive and respectful, which is wonderful. Uh, my younger brother said that he really enjoyed it. And there were a few essays that made him very emotional. Um, because it's, I mean, it's their life too, right? It's just my perception of, of their life, um, which is different than their perception. And I asked my older brother sort of in jest if he was traumatized by the book, by the collection. And he said, ah, you know, if it was a yes, no question, probably yes. But if there was a maybe, then I would definitely check the maybe box. <laughs> And so, I mean, they're, they're enjoying the book and they've read it and they're wildly supportive and excited for me. Uh, but I, it must be really interesting for them to read my words about our parents and my personal life and things you wouldn't necessarily share with your dad or with your siblings um, are now in print and I'm sharing them with everybody. So I also respect their process and how that must feel a little tough at times. Bob, did you read all of the essays separately before the book itself was published? 
No, I don't. I think um, mm -hmm. I was a little. I, I don't know. I, in my imagination, it was exactly the same honors project that you wrote. <laughs> it's the same. Years ago. So, but you know, you've changed. Apparently, you met other people that you didn't tell me about. Which is, you know, we have to talk about that later. But no, no. To answer your question briefly, no. Um, there's a lot of new stuff in it. And we have it. We as we were talking before, we have an Aroostook County, Maine connection. I didn't know about so. Yeah. Right. I know. Kate. I know. Uh, a question from the audience. Does the fact that it's in print make it a little easier to share with family? I mean, they can buy it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it easy to share, I guess. Um, many of my family members, both my, um, you know, my brothers and my parents, as well as my extended family, had read the essays that had been published in other places. Um, because that was a, a big deal for me and stepping stones to getting towards publishing a collection. But um, many of these essays had never, had never sort of seen the light of day until this book was published. So they had access in a new way once this was in, in print. And yes, you have to, if you have a book contract, which is awesome, you have to be prepared to let it go to all of the people and try and encourage that as much as possible. So they, they got access through I, Amazon. I remember that feeling when, when my, the, my first book was published that I'd published lots of things in little magazines, but this one was gonna be reviewed, mm -hmm. purchased by anybody who wanted in libraries. That mm -hmm. was, and then and it was also a family book. So it was the same kind of thing. I remember that. Well, yeah. in one essay in particular, you were with your brothers and you were, skiing and I believe you had to climb some ice if I'm remembering it correctly and your brother had his camera and he was trying to take pictures which he was hoping to sell obviously and you describe the fact that from behind if if I was to look at that picture right in a magazine right now I would see a girl with a braid looking strong and confident you know in a particular like maybe you're wearing a Patagonia jacket and I'm seeing it on the Patagonia website but in reality, that's not how you felt. And so right. I would love for you to sort of give an ex, you know, an example or describe a little bit more for those who haven't read that essay in particular, why you wrote about that. Um, <clears throat> I wrote about that, that moment because I felt like the images or the, the picture did not mirror my feelings and that it was sort of a lie <laughs> that I was up there and I should be this sort of token strong woman and maybe that's even the person I wanted to be in that moment but I was afraid and I was really pushing my limits on a pretty seriously exposed ridge and I just sort of felt like the whole thing was maybe a little dishonest um in the sort of orchestration. And I, I found that interesting, right? It's like what we were talking about before. I was like, why does this moment feel like a little messed up that I'm shaking, but that these photos could appear in some like outdoor gear catalog as someone who's crushing it on an Alaskas, Alaskan ridge line. So that sort of um, disconnect was interesting to me. And, you know, pushing your limits and being afraid is part of learning and being in the outdoors and pursuing a sport so I thought that it was really important to say that like I was afraid and working through this fear and that that's not what it always looks like but that's what was really happening so that's why it was an important moment for me to try and capture one of the things also that again, my coworker Emily and I had sort of touched upon was the, the gender sort of differences, right? So you are out there with a lot of men predominantly, and yet you, you do feature your female friendships in the book in certain ways, but it seemed like you were always the only female. And I'm sure that that must have been really hard for you. And yet I felt like I was able to sort of get a glimpse into how it was for you you seem to act like everything was always okay and like very cool and you're like a cucumber, right? You're cool, calm and collected. And then in reality, you're, you get up there and you do have those fears and that self-doubt. 
Well, and I felt like, you know, writing that essay was me um, being honest and being exposed <laughs> and, um, you know, sort of pushing on that bruise that there's this idea that um, maybe I'm crushing it all the time, but I'm not. I don't think anyone is. Um, but in general, the men that I'm in the outdoors with and the partners that I choose are awesome guys. Um, and I trust them and I, um, I would not choose other partners because the quality of our relationship and the experiences that we've built together, that's what's important to me. Um, less important obviously than gender. I have wonderful, um, women friends who I love to go outdoors with, but it doesn't matter to me as long as the companion is an excellent companion. That's what's important. So I think on some level, that's why my experiences seem sort of smooth is because I've chosen to be there and I've been invited and we've made this intentional um, effort to be ski partners and to do this together. And it's, it has nothing to do with with gender, which is really nice. It's a relief. A question from the audience. Um, she writes, I love the essay Into the Bite and the scene where you mount the spinning horse. You are obviously an outdoors woman, but how did you fit your horsewomanship into this collection? Um, I mean, it's all part of this idea of, of movement and of saying yes and of learning and being challenged. And it's also something I love. So I haven't had the same maybe opportunities in the horse world. It's, it's harder to like own a horse than it is to put on some old skis and like hike up a hill behind your house. Right. So, <laughs> so I think that I gravitated towards skiing in some ways and it's a winter sport, right? Like I'm a product of a place with seasons. Um, but the mentality for me is very similar where you get on a horse that maybe you don't know about and you read that animal and you try and ride that horse um, to the best of your ability, much like you point your skis down a ski slope and you hope it's going to work out. Um, and you trust your accumulation of skills and maybe you'll learn something new um, and maybe it will be great, but that's, a similar challenge for me. Bob, do you feel like students today are coming in and they're at the Kate Doucette level, or do you find that they're not as prepared in their writing as Kate was? Well, I mean, again, Kate, Kate is unusually, was unusually well-prepared, unusually determined to learn a new skill, because I don't know that I, I, don't, I think she was an accomplished writer, but I don't know that the form was something that she'd worked with before. I right. think, you know, to, I think that students, what I'm finding is that I'm thinking about essay as an impulse rather than as a form. And I'm interested in like video essay and the way that, you know, I have a 16 year old son um, who makes multimedia essays, you know, so to speak. So I think rather than trying to, I, I'll tell you, I feel a little bit like I teach a classical instrument now and like the, you know, like an outmoded instrument. And so I'm, you know, acquiescing to the idea that I need to retool and change the way that I teach a little bit to acknowledge that this is the world they live in. And I can try to, you know, turn them to my way, but, you know, I, I'm a little irrelevant. So how can I sort of alter, uh, if that makes any sense? I mean, I, they're, they're, you know, um, they're very, very bright students. And they, I think maybe in some ways they have more experience. They're more aware of what's going on in the world because of things like social media. Um, but the classic lessons about clarity and brevity and concision and, and reflection and, and critical thinking are, are always going to be there. It's just the, the, the medium itself. You know, I, I need to learn a little bit about the, the world they're coming in from. Um, yeah, but again, Kate, you know, is you know, it was, it was a special case. That's why we're doing this, so. Sure. Question from the audience. Do you think that there's a judgment and value between the written word and video as far as craft? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I feel like you're queued up to answer that one, Bob. I, can I see it? I'm going to look in the Q&A and read the sure. question. It's under answers. Okay. While uh, you do that, I can actually ask Kate yeah. another question. Kate, another um, question for you. One of our worst fears is to be exposed and humans like solutions. Where did the skill, this skill in particular come from in your life? Um, the skill, the desire to look for solutions. Right. I mean, I think it's a product of, of my childhood, but also my education. Um, yeah, I, it's interesting because I, I do like solutions and I like plans and I, um, ideally you, you get those things, but especially when we're talking about, um, for me, writing and sport, I feel like there aren't always a lot of solutions. They're processes, right? Like you're in it and you're learning and you're trying to get better. And the same thing with, um, with skiing or riding or running or hiking. Like I never feel like I reach, uh, solution maybe it's the pursuit of that solution that sort of keeps dragging me through this process um but I think looking for improvement is what mostly keeps me going through these uh, I think that I will probably never reach and I hope an end point in this sort of searching through writing and to improve through sport right I mean, it's, it's sort of like, I think we as humans, I mean, this is from my perspective, at least I've always been chasing, like, I just want to know why I just, if, if somebody could tell me the answer and then I'll be fine and I'll move on, but I have to learn that sometimes I'm not going to get the answer that I want. I'm not going to get the closure that I want. Right. And I know that sort of came through in a few essays when I was reading them, but I have to realize that I'm not going to have the, the answer that I want or the closure that I want. And I, I, I'm happy that you also touched upon that in the book. Yeah, it's messier sometimes than trying to find the solution, I guess. Okay, Bob, are you ready to answer now? Well, cool. yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that because, we, because film is a popular, also a popular genre that we, we tend to be a little snottier about writing. I teach an essay in a class on film adaptation called what, what novels can do that films can't and vice versa. That, you know, uh, they're so, such very different media and yet the best films are, are well-written. So, you know, I mean, I, I, that's not an answer at all. We could do a whole other hour on that. It's a great question. I don't want, I'm gonna give Kate the last word though. Okay. On whatever. <laughs> all right, Kate, final question of the night. This is one that I thought a lot about. So I hope you're okay with it. Out of all of the places that you've skied, you've hiked, you know, the kayaking, that was probably one of the most terrifying essays I've ever read. I'm probably never going to go kayaking again. If you close your eyes, what one stands out the most? Um, <clears throat> I have to pick a, a region. Um, I love British Columbia. Um, I've been there a lot. I've been super fortunate to do a ton of trips there. And the quality of both the snow and the companionship um, have made those trips just stellar experiences that will always stick with me and I will always wanna go back. That's nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kate and to Bob for joining me on North Country Bookmarks Live. Normally I'm behind, you know, in like closed doors, literally in a mini recording studio where no one can see me. And so it's nice to be able to see faces and talk to actual people. So thank you both so much for joining me. NCPR is obviously member supported. So I would not be doing my job correctly if I didn't say you can visit ncpr.org slash give so we can keep doing programs like North Country Bookmarks Live. Kate, Bob, thank you again. I hope everybody has a great night and thanks to everybody for participating. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for having me on, Jess. And yeah, have a great night.